Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of HBO's The Last of Us Episode 2, Infected. The interesting visual details, connections to the game, and deeper layers of meaning. And you know what I did mention last week? That clicker visible on the rooftop in the final shot. But you better believe Joel Ellie and Tess didn't miss him and his friends this episode with their mistletoe moves. But hey, I did get that flower theory right in my follow-up short. And you know what? A few of you even called me a dummy for saying the infection was spread by flower-coated Hollywood handshakes. But it's all good. We're going to break down everything you missed. And for more of my deeper analysis, please subscribe to New Rockstar's new channel, The Deep Dive, in which every week I'll investigate titles like Everything Everywhere All at Once with a more pointed focus. It's launching February 17th. Okay, episode two opens in Jakarta, Indonesia, which came up on a radio broadcast last episode. Disturbances in Jakarta, but are advised... It's September 24th, 2003, two days before outbreak day, and you can already hear sirens starting. In this restaurant, we see close-ups of flour-based food in people's dishes, but Ibu Ratna is eating only skewered meat and a salad. When these officers enter, all the patrons go silent. Now, in 2003, Indonesia was under a period of reform under President Megawati Sukarno Putri, but this was right after a tumultuous new order period that lasted from 1966 to 98 under Suharto, who was a military dictator. These patrons would definitely be old enough to remember a time when badges showing up during lunch meant trouble. Just really, really like this detail. The officer Hidaya apologized for interrupting the lunch and Ibu says no need, she was just finishing. Cautiously abundant courtesy, because both of these people are scared out of their minds, they're wanting the other one to like them since they believe the other holds their life in their hands. Now, Ibu is a professor of mycology, the study of fungi. The front desk translates to Ministry of Health of Indonesia, and we pass signs for SARS, which earlier that year, February 2003, was the bigger infection of concern, a respiratory virus, largely in China. The authority tells Ibu to identify the specimen. We need to help Bu Ratna to analyze the specimen. Yeah, it's clear that Ibu was brought in as a second opinion and they are hoping for better news from her. In general, I love this intro because many associate infections from other countries with a kind of xenophobic hypochondria. Oh no, can I even like drink the water in that country? But we see here that it wasn't immediate chaos in the streets of Jakarta. An academic expert in Ground Zero diagnosed it immediately and still could not stop it. Ibu examines his corpse and first notices a bullet wound in the head, not a good sign. She makes an incision on the leg, revealing a layer of cordyceps tissue directly beneath the skin, which is crazy. It's like the stuffing of a plush toy. This means it's not muscle tissue that's moving the limbs of the infected. It's just all fungus tendrils underneath there. And she checks the throat and yuck! Living cordyceps tendril reaches out for a hug. Even through Ibu's plastic protective suit, the fungus knows that she's there. As she plays from the room, the tendrils continue to reach upward out of the mouth. This scene reminded me a lot of the autopsy scene in The Silence of the Lambs when they realized that the moth cocoon was embedded in the victim's throat. It's sickening, but it's all also the key clue that Clarice later uses to identify Buffalo Bill, and here in this scene, foreshadowing the kiss of death that will take Tess. Hidayat confirms the transmission happened 30 hours prior at a flour and grain factory on the west side of Jakarta, and Ibu calls it the perfect substrate. The substrate meaning a surface or material on which an organism can live. This confirms my theory that the fungus is spread by flour in the food supply. Jakarta has the world's largest flour mill, and last episode, Sarah noted that they were out of pancake mix, the Adlers offer biscuits that Joel turned down, Ms. Adler makes raisin cookies that Sarah f hates. We get a close-up of the heat rising and those cookies growing, and later that night, Joel forgets to pick up cake. Now, this shot of Ibu is an extended multi-minute take, and I just love that we never cut away and we have to stay with her in this horror for this whole unbroken moment. Ibu attempts some contact tracing, learning that they don't know who bit the woman before the factory, and then learns... Lalu pekerjaan lain bagaimana? 14 orang hilang. Yeah, the moment she hears 14, her hand rattles the tea. She never takes a sip of it either, afraid to ingest anything. Like Dr. Newman in episode one, Ibu says that there is no treatment possible, and instead just looks at this military officer to give him one solution that he'll understand. Bom. Mulailah pengoboman. Yeah, and I like how even in another language, the word is the same, bomb. And it's the same solution the Americans try on their own cities. Is this where they bombed? Yeah, they hit most of the big cities like this. They had to slow the spread somehow. It worked here, but it 
didn't in most places. So then we open on Ellie sleeping in the fetal position, surrounded by green moss, just a pure natural state like a fetus in utero. The next stage of human evolution potentially resistant to the fungus. A butterfly flaps past her, recalling the butterflies on Sarah's pillowcase, as Ellie supplants Sarah as the daughter figure that Joel must protect. Butterflies are symbols of transformation, from the caterpillar to the cocoon, metapod to butterfree. And as the world goes through biological transformations around them, these characters must undergo psychological transformations in order to adapt and to survive survive. Change is inevitable. Now this room used to be a salon. If you look at the door, that's super cuts. This would be a place where you do get makeovers and transform your look. That's a magazine that you flip through for hairstyle inspiration that Tess tosses Ellie to use as toilet paper. Now like Professor Ibu, Joel's hand also trembles, but from his savage beating of that soldier the night before, he is shaking because for the first time in decades, he feels something. You need to stop talking about this kid like she's got some kind of life in front of her. He's trying to stifle the affection he's feeling by liking Ellie with Sarah and how quickly Sarah's future was snuffed out. Now, Tess is really interesting to watch in this scene because notice how overnight she's become a true believer. She made it through the f***ing night. Job. It doesn't matter. Craig Mason and Neil Druckmann revealed that they actually wrote and shot a whole backstory for Tess that they ultimately removed. Tess was a wife and a mother and both her husband and her son got infected. She had to kill her husband, but she couldn't bring herself to kill her kid, so she just locked him in the basement. And presumably, he's now a clicker, according to Mason. So, Tess's newfound hope for Ellie, her hope for redemption, and for all the shit she's done, is grounded in what she did to her family. Post-apocalyptic Boston looks incredible, with vines growing out everywhere from the crumbling buildings and the corroding cars. Really smart VFX detail here. Joel's head blocks out a glare from a background building window, tricking our brains into thinking everything in the background is practical and affecting us physically, when in reality that leaning skyscraper is totally VFX. Like in the game, the atmosphere is immersive, and the production designers just did a really good job blending the foreground practical sets and the background VFX so you don't really know where the line is. The police car they pass is the Boston PD Ford Expedition, the make, model, and paint job even that Suffolk County cops used in the year 2003. They also step past a stuffed giraffe, which could be a nod to the giraffe that you run into and give a good boy pat in the game. Ellie tells Tess that she was bitten after sneaking into the boarded up mall in the QZ. So it was just you in there alone? Yeah. Yeah, Ellie sniffs because there is more to that story, which I'll get to at the end in Spoiler Corner. Ellie also shares some myths that she's heard. So there aren't super infected that explode fungus spores on you? Shit, I hope not. Or ones with split open heads that stay in the dark like bats? Uh, the second kind refers to clickers. And yeah, definitely we're gonna meet a few of them in this episode. I'll talk about the various stages of infected in Spoiler Corner, just in case you wanna be surprised by what's coming. I love how this hotel has become an entirely new ecosystem, a swampy pond. A frog perches on the keys of the piano, creating a diegetic horror score. <laughs> Later, Ellie adds to this music when she gets scared by the corpse. Every bottle and glass they pass in the hotel now has plant life growing out of it, as water and nutrients would have collected inside and created a sort of petri dish ecosystem for life to form. Joel gives Tess a boost that she can crawl through the cave-in. Joel and Tess giving each other boosts and pulling each other up on ledges like this. It's just a common move that you do in this early section of the game. Joel and Ellie have this moment alone, and Ellie asks how long infected live. Well, some last about a month or two. But there's others been walking around about 20 years. Yeah, a bit of foreshadowing for some longtime infected hosts whose fungal layers just keep growing and growing. Again, I'll explain more of this in Spoiler Corner. The three of them look down and see rows of an infected laying down below. The last time we were here, they were still deep inside the buildings. Then I guess enough people came through looking for the QZ. We went inside seeking shelter. And that's how they get more and more of the city, bit by bit, year after year. Ah, so this tells us that the Boston QZ is not necessarily secure permanently, and explains why Joel and Tess were ready to leave it even before meeting Ellie. Now, I love to eat. What I do not love is trying to figure out what to eat. I get confused when I get hungry, and it makes figuring out how to get unhungry particularly tricky. That's why I love taking the guesswork out of what I'm gonna eat by using Factor. In the past, you might have heard me say something similar for HelloFresh. Well, Factor is now owned by HelloFresh. I use both, and it's great. Factor not only lets me skip the trip to the grocery store, but I also get to skip chopping, prepping, and cleaning up. Factor meals are ready in two minutes, so all you gotta do is just heat and enjoy. Each meal is prepared by chefs and approved by dietitians, so you know they have all the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long, no matter what your diet calls for. Factor has keto, calorie smart, vegan, vegetarian, and protein plus meals on the menu each week. Factor has 34 weekly options, so there's always something new to try. Plus, you can round out your meal and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of over 36 quick bites, smoothies, juices, and more satisfying add-ons. So this month, I got this shredded chicken cheesy ranch bacon. Cheesy 
bacon ranch shredded chicken. I call dibs on this one. I like cheesy, I like shredded, I like bacon, and I like ranch. We got jalapeno lime cheddar chicken. We're giving this one to Kelly because she loves, loves, loves jalapeno. I got a cottage pie I'm dying to try out. I got some fusilli I can't wait to eat. But I tried out the shredded chicken and folks, it blew my mind. Oh, that is so good. This is without question the easiest way to eat healthy, delicious food without becoming the numbers lady meme at the grocery store. To get started, just head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code rockstars60 to get 60% off your first factor box. Once more, that's factor75.com and use code rockstars60 to get 60% off your first factor box. The infected all react to sunlight in a wave. They're connected. More than you know, the fungus also grows underground. Long fibers like wires, some of them stretching over a mile. You step on a patch of cordyceps in one place, and you can wake a dozen infected from somewhere else. Okay, so this whole idea of Cordyceps hive mind, like the neural chemical network of Pandora and Avatar, is a new thing in the HBO series. It's not something really in the game, or at least not established yet. We probably know by now if it was. But to be clear, when we're using a term like hive mind, we should separate the idea of mind from the idea of cognition. Behind the scenes at New Rockstars, our sales guy Berg was giving me an amazing lecture on this subject. Both the idea of a mind and the idea of cognition are metaphysical concepts debated by scientists, especially when it comes to things like AI. So it's not that fungi are sentient the way humans are and are working collectively to outsmart us and hunt us, but they do collectively react to environmental stimuli and are capable as a colony of living for years and years and years and accomplishing some complex things. But at that point you get to the debate of, well, are humans just reacting to environmental stimuli? Like, I don't know, I get hungry at sundown, sleepy at midnight, and every time my wife revs up the microwave, I piss my pants and forget who I am for a half hour or so. Mm. But this change to the show accomplishes two things. One, there's some thematic takeaway here that Cordyceps is beating us by being more communicative and better connected than humanity is, like arguably the more worthy species of taking over planet Earth. But two, it gives the fungi a ranged threat that you could say they lose by the show omitting the spore component of them. This is just a new way that the fungus can get us. You're not immune from being ripped apart. Now, in the museum, they pass displays of the Boston Tea Party and portraits of founding fathers, all covered in dried cordyceps, as if all of American history was rendered pointless by a fungal infection that swallowed our entire society. The infected corpses they pass still bear some human features that are just eerily preserved, because as we saw before, the muscle tissue beneath the skin gets replaced by the fungus, so that delays the decomposition that our bodily fluids would have caused. They end up trapped in a room with two clickers. Now, these are the blind infected individuals formed by the fungus splitting open their heads, and like bats, they use echolocations like clicks to perceive their surroundings. Now, last week, my buddy Ryan Airy at Screen Crush pointed out the motif of ticking clocks in the episode one flashbacks. And you may have noticed when Sarah dies, Joel's watch breaks and freezes on the exact moment of her death. And now in this moment, I loved hearing how the clockwork ticking of the old world has been replaced with sporadic random clicking of the clickers, because now time truly has no meaning. Ellie, though, is unable to silence her own gasp. <laughs> Notice how this clicker compared to other infected runners or stalkers, wears clothes that are more worn down. Because that's because to get like this, Clickers must have been infected for over a year, longer than most other infected that we see. His wet and slimy head has had its skull split down to the top row of teeth in the palate, but the fungus has otherwise left the mouth intact because it needs the mouth for oral transmission. When Joel shoots the chest, it's ineffective because the fungus doesn't feel pain and really doesn't need any of the vital organs that would have been in the chest region, only really the brain and the brainstem. Joel removes the bullets from his revolver, Just the little sound of the shells alerts that clicker. And I love how the camera stays on Joel as the clicker starts to move toward us, but frames it out so that, like Joel, we just have to guess where it is. And they upped the volume on those clicks to signal to us that he is now just a few feet away around the corner. So Joel, having faced these things before, knows how to use the clicker's own echolocation methods to echolocate it. And notice how we don't see where Tess is for most of the sequence, or how she loses her clicker. Just a little warning sign that something probably went down off screen with her. Now Tess says there's no going back home. And notice how their path through this museum caves in behind them, which is similar to the experience of playing the game, and many games really. Your path closes off behind you and there's only one path forward. It's just so sad to rewatch this episode from here forward for Anna Torres' performance, like when Joel wraps tape around her foot and she just looks at him with tears in her eyes. There's probably more ahead. 
So we'll deal with it then. Tess gets a moment alone, and her hand does twitch a bit. Not sure if it's voluntary or not, but muscle spasms are a symptom. And notice how Tess yelps in pain when her arm on the side where the bite is grabs a ladder. Joel, after watching Ellie go down the ladder, very suddenly looks down at his watch, unable to look at Ellie without thinking of his daughter Sarah. Tess walks ahead of them toward the state house, more in a rush than they are, and to hide her shoulder bite. Notice how when she turns around, you can see blood sprayed on her neck. Joel doesn't notice because he's too busy looking at Ellie's more recent scratch, worried that she's going to turn. So when they get to the state house, they find everyone dead already, which is another contrast from the games. In the games, Tess has to hold all this down as Pedro soldiers come in and there's a big shootout. But like last episode, this series shows the heroes in the present day stumbling upon the aftermath of the human versus human shootouts instead of taking down person after person like you do sometimes in the game, except for specific moments from Joel. Here, Joel explains what happened. One of them got bit, the healthy ones fought the sick ones, everyone lost. And Tess reveals her infected bite and compares it to Ellie's scratch that has no effect. This is real. Josh is real. I need you to get her to Bill and Frank's. And yes, Tess's hand tremor is more severe now. Tess says, I, I never ask you for anything, not to feel the way I felt, not to, will you shut the fuck up because I don't have time. It's just so tragic in her final minutes. She doesn't even have time to profess her love for Joel because she knows that they missed their window. And she continues, You get her there, you keep her alive, and you set everything right. All this shit we did. Yes, Tess sees the promise of Joel getting Ellie to safety and a possible cure to cordyceps as her one hope for redemption. Joel shoots the infected host and the cordyceps in the soil latches onto his hands. You see the fungal colony at work. Similar tendrils snake under a fingernail, lifted a little, ugh, I know, I know, I know. But the dinner bell has been rung. Actually, the stalker we see here up close is the same one that'll eventually plant the smooch on Tess. Tess sets up the place to blow up and has this final moment with Joel. Say who you can say. You can tell that Joel totally wants to give her a goodbye kiss right now. But at this point, a kiss with an infected is a kiss of death. So this is the closest they get. And all the infected arrive, and this stalker closes in for a kiss. And ugh, in addition to the undeniable grossness of the tendril transmission, it's just an additional violation because a kiss is such an intimate gesture. Now this actor's named Philip Berjou, and look how bad this guy looks. When you lose that fungal makeup, uh... Hello there. So this kiss just feels like an especially cruel perversion, reminding me of the overtly sexual design of the xenomorph anatomy in Alien. This is another example of the showrunner's subversive theme of the series, the danger of love. This kiss is a loving gesture, and even from the perspective of the cordyceps, it is a kind of loving embrace. It's one piece of the fungus recognizing and connecting with another piece of the fungus. Yet, that love is destructive and violent, and let's never forget that. But Tess is able to bring the suffering to an end by finally igniting the lighter, which she drops thanks to her hand's muscle spasms. And so the room explodes, bringing us back to Professor Ibu's only real solution to deal with the infected bomb. Okay, on to spoiler corner for those of you who know what's coming in the games or for those of you who don't really mind, I will give additional warnings for any big spoilers like character deaths or other big twists that the show has not indicated at all. And so for the spoiler corner, it's just gonna be some general knowledge that some may consider to be fun surprises for the coming episodes, which is why I put it here. Okay, so yeah, Ellie was not the only one in the mall. Riley was there with her, but like Joel not wanting to talk about Sarah, Ellie doesn't wanna talk about her lost loved one. Notice how Ellie also indicated no boyfriend is gonna come looking for her. And then Ellie's mention of of super infected that explode fungus spores on you that Tess and Joel thought was a myth, totally an odd to bloaters, one of which shows up in the trailer, so we know a bloater is coming. Bloaters are the several year old infected hosts with fungal layers that have formed like armor and tear chunks of that fungus off themselves to throw like spore bombs. Actually, early in the game, there is a Fedra handout showing the stages of infected from runner to stalker to clicker to, and then the bloater stage is torn off. Now there's also a stage of infected later in the games called shamblers that are found near water that spray spore clouds. But really in general, this whole talk of a hive mind and some infected being 20 years old, the full length of the pandemic, maybe the show at least indicating to viewers or people who have played part two that things are gonna eventually get to the Rat King from part two of the games. The Rat King is a freakish 20 year old beast in the Seattle area made up of multiple infected hosts fused together. His one was frightening bosses of the game. While I definitely don't think the Rat King is gonna come in season one, this has gotta be something the show is gonna get to in season two or season three. Hey, a reminder to subscribe to our new channel, The Deep Dive, launching February 17th. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars and subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching, bye.